Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, may I uh, call you to order? Uh, my name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the president of the Danube Institute. And uh, together with the Foundation for Pacific Hungary, uh, we're delighted to be sponsoring this book launch today. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, before I uh, introduce our uh, two principal uh, conversationalists, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ferenc Brada, the Director General of the Foundation for Pacific Hungary, to say a few words. Mr. Brada. Uh, thank you for Mr. President. Uh, dear Mr. President, dear Director, dear professors, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you on the book launch of uh, Professor Stone's new book, uh, Hungary, a Short History. As a historian and uh, the general director of uh, the Foundation uh, for a Civic Hungary, I am extraordinarily happy that uh, we contributed to and uh, supported this project. What motivated us to join when Professor Stone approached uh, us with his idea? Our foundation aims to promote civic or, if you wish, conservative ideas uh, in, and, and, and cultural heritage. This book can be an instrument uh, to make the world understand our Hungarian uh, civic conservative traditions. There is a saying on history which uh, said that uh, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. As, uh, Norm, as, as Professor Norman Stone shows in this book, uh, in his book this uh, saying is very true for, for the Hungarian history. Thank you for your att attention. Enjoy the book launch and enjoy the book. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I would um, and I'd like again uh, to welcome you and to stress uh, how pleased we are that you were able, we're able to do this jointly. Um, excuse me. Uh, we're, 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 we're going there. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. These little hitches always make it more interesting. Um, th um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Professor Stone, Norman Stone, um, and um, Gergely Romsic, Professor Romsic, who, is, who are going to now conduct a conversation uh, about um, Professor Stone's book. I will say, I'm not going to lead out the list of distinctions, academic and uh, other that cultural that they both um, have, you can see the, those things on the program we've left for you. I'm just going to say very briefly uh, two things. One is, um, Professor Stone is uh, an old friend. We first met helping to write a speech for Margaret Thatcher uh, about 25 years ago. Um, if you read that speech, it's uh, the speech she gave at the Hague, uh, you'll see a, a marvelous line about the um, the, the misbehavior of people in the, hunger, in the Habsburg Parliament. Uh, I think that uh, definitely didn't come from me. Um, but Professor Stone, in addition to um, uh, having held distinction, distinct, um, distinguished professorships uh, in uh, Oxford and in Bill Kent University, um, is also a, a historian who has a huge and well-deserved popular following. He writes marvelous history that, enjoy, that allows those of us who want to know more about our past to do so in the most enjoyable way, and, and we're grateful to him for that. I'm also grateful that he's been very helpful to us here at the Danube Institute in a thousand ways. Professor Romsic has been to several of our uh, other occasions. Um, uh, he has uh, uh, played a reading role, and today he is uh, going to conduct a conversation. Now, the thing about a conversation is, it doesn't have any purpose other than itself. In this case, it has the purpose also of interesting you in the book. But of course, we don't know where a conversation will lead in the very nature of conversations. They go in the directions that they go in. They can't be predicted in advance. But I'm fairly confident that at the end of the conversation, you will want to go to Mr. Lang, who's here, and buy the book, which is available, which I'm told Professor Stone has generously agreed to sign. So I'm going to step back now, retreat 
to the front row of the stalls along with uh, my co other colleague and um, leave the conversation uh, to begin at the suggestion uh, uh, with the protagonist on this occasion being Professor Romsic. Um, I can hear that this mic is in fact working, which is great. And let's see if Professor Stone's. Boom. Good. Okay. Uh, please. Especially in the first minutes, do signal uh, if he, he, holding the mic too far away from uh, our mouths, it always takes a bit of a fine tuning to find the right distance. But uh, without further ado, since we've been so nicely introduced, and uh, uh, thank you very much to our hosts uh, uh, for this kind introduction and, and for the possibility of this event, we have a, an absolutely fascinating book on our hands. Fascinating for several reasons. Uh, I think one of the reasons is that uh, Professor Stone, if I may be so bold as to say, you are not afraid to engage in the fine art of historical judgment, which is something that the, the status of which has been questioned. So let me take a sort of a, a broader approach and propose that we have a peculiar tradition in British historiography uh, which includes people whom you are not necessarily in agreement with, but with whom you are nevertheless somehow linked. I will give you one name, A.J.P. Taylor. I know you disagree with A.J.P. Taylor on, on a number of issues, and the book's, book also make, makes that clear. But British history, British historians, when writing about continental Europe, have been extremely um, efficient at... Um, destroying some of the myths that we cherish about ourselves, continentals as we are, uh, and engage in that with more than just a bit of irony at times. I'm curious, about if, if before discussing the book itself, if I may, I, I would be curious to hear a little about your approach to the subject as a historian, the relationship of British conservatism, irony, um, the outside view, on uh, the developments in Central Europe. How do you, you know, having your roots in those islands over the channel, uh, look at and approach uh, a very landlocked subject, the history of Hungary? And uh, when you engage in assessing historical eras, personalities, which you do with great acumen, um, what, what was your sort of guiding principle, uh, lecturing the British public, the international public, um, marking out people's places in history. Um, how do you see your position different from the historians that write about this history from Hungary or from Austria, from, from the region, basically? What is the peculiar Britishness of your contribution? Well, I, th um, I think I can more. Can I be heard? Um, I think I can more or less sum it up. I wanted to write the Airbnb history of Hungary um, because uh, there are, uh, you know, there are so many educated, um, uh, mainly English, uh, uh, but of course you sometimes see Scots who will be interested in the history of Hungary. Um, it, and uh, I mean, I might as well start off by saying that, that um, uh, there are about twelve short histories of Hungary. I'm not including your father in this. Um, they, but rather they try to be short, and a lot of them are just deadly dull. You know, you really need to shove a hat pin into your thigh to keep awake, and it's not a dull subject, not at all. Um, it's, uh, there are, is that better? Good. Um, I mean, if I can digress a little bit, my two favorites are old books. Um, one is by, uh, he called himself Paul Ignotus in England. He'd, um, uh, he'd been in prison in Hungary and uh, ended up in England. He wrote a short history of Hungary, which is quite short, in 1972. And it's got the enormous virtue of talking in a way I couldn't possibly about the, uh, the language and the literature. Uh, and of course he was a journalist and he could write. And the other one was, uh, has anybody in this room ever heard of Dana Sinor? 
Did you? Well, tell me if what I've heard about him is accurate. And um, this, uh, he started off as a converted Jew in Kolozhvar. Then, because he couldn't go to university, ended up in some funny job in Mishkolt, working together with somebody else. Now, in 1942, and this is the sort of thing I admire about Hungary, in 1942, he became the cultural representative of Hungary in Vichy, France. Um, and he kept the professors going with coffee and ham. And then in February 1944, he joined the resistance. So in 1945, everybody but everybody gave him, gave him a medal. And, <laughs> and, the, and the English gave him a job in um, Magdalen College, Cambridge, where I vaguely coincided. And then in 1960 or thereabouts, he got an offer from the University of Chicago. And he was a real scholar. He was the sort of, uh, no, I was one of the, sorry, I'm talking much too much. <laughs> I think you can't talk too much about a, a, a character like Professor Seiner, so it's very, well worth listening, trust me. And the, one of the things about Hungary is this, uh, well, I, I, obsession with um, where, where on earth do we come from? And uh, Shinor used to, uh, used, he was the sort of man who could read Mongol tombs. And uh, I mean, a real scholar. So he got his job in Chicago. Now, the Americans at that time believed in doctorates. So they said, uh, Professor Shinor, have you got, you've got your graduate papers, your doctorates. Of course, he didn't have any of that sort of thing. And he said, oh, oh they all get, uh, there was a war, all the papers went missing. And he said, well, have you written anything? And in about six weeks flat, he wrote a short history of Hungary, which is wonderfully readable, especially about the Middle Ages. When he comes on to Maria Theresa, it just becomes notes. But he then went on, of course, to be an immensely distinguished man. Now, these two are still very good. There are other people who've tried it. Um, and I th the, um, it, it, uh, one or two of them not too bad, but, uh, uh, you know, when I was writing, I, um, I was conscious of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, as Newton said, your father. Uh, there's uh, Brian Cartledge's History of Hungary, which is a very good piece of work. I'm not sure I would have in his shoes tried the Middle Ages because you know, to understand the religious mind, to understand the sort of world where you take the gross national product and put it in a hole in the ground, it is very, very difficult. And the other one is Annabelle uh, Barbara, The Blue Guide to Budapest, which is just out, which is an absolutely superb piece of work. If you want to see, go around the Taban and see Council uh, social housing from the Horty era, it's all there. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that sort of book, by God, one respects it. Now, uh, I'll shut up in a minute. Uh, uh, it is. I think we are here because of you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think the. It, it is curious that the. I think the British are better than any other people at doing other people's history. Um, the French, not bad, but um, if I think about it, you know, there are some great names in, um, in Raymond Carr on Spain, for instance, uh, Dennis Mac Smith on Italy, um, very, very considerable, uh, considerable experts on France, Richard Cobb, front, uh, and so on. It is, a, it is something, I don't know why this, why the British should be so good in this respect, because we're weaker in other things, of course. Um, but the, histori the historical tradition is a good one. And the other thing I think that makes history important in England is that we, we don't do political science. Uh, political science came up very much as a sort of Cinderella subject. People sniffed about it and said that it was uh, taking what everybody knew and putting it into a language no one could understand. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, and history has remained popular in British universities in a way that 
it, uh, it doesn't do um, it, it doesn't do on the continent. When I was in Turkey, people who were bright did international relations, um, largely because of the romantic title. Because if you, if you did history at university, it meant you were heading to become a sort of demented nationalist primary teacher. Um, and so international relations attracted the bright, um, the bright people. Uh, A.J.P. Taylor, well, uh, it's the style that captivates. No doubt there were things wrong with him. I knew him and his third wife, who was Eva Horace, who was Hungarian. Um, really very well in the end, and she looked after him devotedly. Um, uh, I mean, you got out of Taylor, uh, he, he's his best friend in Central Europe was uh, Michael Caroy. They got on very well indeed. And um, he got his impressions of Hungary from, uh, from, uh, from Caroy. Later on, under Eva Horesty's domination, he took a different sort of view. And, uh, and, um, and I have to say I rather followed him in that. In the 1960s, you picked up Seton Watson uh, and you picked up A.J.P. Taylor and you, you had question marks about Hungary at the very least. Then, uh, as, uh, as I got older, and began to look into things, I began to understand quite, quite what old Hungary had managed to achieve. Which, you know, look at, look at Pest. That's all I need to say. And I went to Transylvania in 1982 um, with uh, one of these funny tourist dodges by which you arrive at the airport, uh, you, uh, you get a car, and vouchers for hotels. And, um, uh, and uh, so we drove around, went to Yash, went through um, Moldavia. Uh, and then uh, I got a terrible disease on my face called impetigo from a filthy hotel bed, bedroom in a place which in happier days was called the Hotel zur Deutschen Krone in Bistritz. Um, uh, <laughs> and and uh, then I uh, crossed over the border at a place called Kirli Baba, which I think means Hairy Daddy in Turkish. Um, is that right? Uh, uh, and you cross into Transylvania, and since I spoke, of, I didn't speak Hungarian at all well, but at least I could say something. So I was very well looked after in Moros Vasarhe. The place was cleaner. It was obviously a different civilization altogether. And uh, oh, since then, I've been coming to Hungary very happily and watching what's been going on. And when, when I had the invitation to write this history, I jumped, I jumped at it. And I've been here for four years, five years, and um, I've been learning a great deal. Um, I think that's enough for the moment. No, but I think um, <laughs> that also opens up a vista that kind of builds on, um, on, on my initial question and will help us to actually start discussing the book, which, despite its size, it's not overly large, does contain a lot of very astute assessments of, of complex historical uh, questions. Um, I, I will wager that what you said about um, the preference in Britain for a sort of a long historical view um, as opposed to, let's call it a, a more American political science dominated approach is a very different mentality and mindset of, of, of empire and sort of an imperial legacy, uh, which perhaps helps the author to uh, mix judgment and criticism with empathy, which is sort of a, if you compare American troops in Iraq in 2004 and compare British troops in Iraq, in southern Iraq in 2004, I think the difference between the two imperial legacies becomes very obvious. The British is sort of getting, knowing the locals, getting on um, sort of a, a softer hand in, in, in introducing, but nevertheless introducing certain uh, 
new perspectives into where they are. And this is, I think, very true of the book. Let me turn to a discussion of, uh, of our own small empire with which the book really begins. By that I mean the post-1867 constellation when Hungary was part of, a, of an ailing but nevertheless first-rate power, Austria-Hungary, and had its own quasi-mini empire to run, being a multinational country. And I think Professor Stone uh, very much does justice to the achievements of the era, but this book is certainly not silent about the hypertrophization of national sentiment uh, that accompanied this period of uh, rather rapid development after a succession of crises. I, I'm, I would be curious um, about your take on the roots of Hungarian nationalism. It's very much embedded into this triumphant era of which you managed to see the sort of less bright side as well. And I think um, I really cannot argue with you because I, ten I very much agree with what you write about this era. Um, how would you, for those of you who have not read the book, uh, um, sort of offering a teaser here, how would you uh, assess, uh, in short, this era? Because for Hungarians, this is our last sort of golden age, if you like, as far as our historical consciousness goes. Now, uh, you certainly do not deny the achievements, but you give a very nuanced image. So if, you, if your readership were Hungarian for a moment, let's imagine, and not international and not British, what would be your sort of final assessment? How should Hungarians look at this era? Well, again, I, I think in so many ways you just need to look at Pest. It's, um, you know, if you think what it was in 1850 or thereabouts and, and uh, what it was turned into in about two generations with some extraordinary, remarkable buildings in um, round about 1900. And, <coughs> and you know, one, one forgets just how much was done in that period of, of um, really stamping a country out of the ground. And it, I, I think if you're doing that kind of thing, you have to have some kind of consciousness of national solidarity. Now, there's one thing, for instance, which interests me quite a lot. What on earth is it like uh, to be a little Hungarian infant of two, uh, or two or three, and to realize that your language is so far away from anybody else's? Um, I mean, it must create a most extraordinary sense of um, cultural isolation to do that. Um, and it's something Paul Ignotus went into a bit. And it's hardly surprising that uh, a certain kind of nationalism comes out of it. Um, you know, let's, we, which, of course, comes out with Victor Orban nowadays. That um, if we're surrounded by all these aliens, as it were, uh, we have to stand up for ourselves. Now, if you take the period of 1890, you know, the, the period of the millennium, I suppose you could say, obviously you can say, yes, this was going far too far. The triumphalism which put up Hungarian national monuments in Brosho, in, uh, in Kronstadt, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, some of the nationalism of that period does sound overdone, but look, I mean, in that respect, Hungary was not unique, not unique at all. Uh, and there are, there are good sides to it. For instance, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Scotsman, as you can possibly, it's an obsolete accent. Nobody speaks like me, um, or at least only a few people in the West End of Glasgow who are my age. Um, the done thing now is to speak another sort of Scottish. And uh, I'm pretty hostile to Scottish nationalism. I can't see what on earth it's about. What a provincial nonsense. And um, by analogy, I'm also extremely hostile to Catalan nationalism. I can't see what it's for. Oh, by the way, when um, the Scottish independence thing came up, uh, the Seke people in, um, in Transylvania 
who are uh, Calvinists, um, uh, had demonstrations in favor of independent Scotland. What they didn't realize was that the people who are behind the Scottish nationalist movement are usually of Catholic and Irish origin. <laughs> somebody, somebody ought to tell them. <laughs> Most, uh, thank God that thing didn't go through. Now, but that sort of nationalism, Catalan nationalism in, uh, say, Gaudi's time, does have a very positive side in the way of education, building up national self-confidence, good writers, good architects. Look at Finland, for instance. I'm very fond of the Finns. They have very little uh, sense of pr pretentiousness. The Finnish flag, when it came up in 1918, uh, they said, oh, we've got to have a national flag. And what they did was they, the, the, um, the Finnish Yacht Club, which was run by Swedes mainly, had a, the cross of St. Andrew, blue, on a white background. And when it came to the Finnish national flag, they just made the cross of St. Andrew vertical. That was it. Um, and no nonsense about stamping out Swedish. They were good. And if you look at that kind of nationalism, it's, it's very productive, very productive as well, in Hungary and all sorts of levels. But then there's the shadow side, of course. Now, uh, and one trouble about writing the history of Hungary is that you are really writing the history of Germany for a lot of the time, and even Italy, um, because Hungarian history got very much affected from outside, and particularly Germany. Now, what can you do in 1914 when uh, the First World War starts, that um, the, it's pretty obvious that the, uh, the Germans have lost patience uh, with, uh, particularly with Russia. They thought Russia was growing much too strong and would be the superpower of the future. Bettmann Holweg's private secretary said, wrote it down uh, on the 7th of July, 1914, that Bettmann Holweg was saying this, the, uh, the Russians are becoming too strong. The weight they weigh upon us like an Alp. Uh, like an Alp. Uh, the generals say we can win this war now, but not by 1917 when the railway system is completed in Russia. And in a sense he was right, in that uh, the Germans did win that war. It comes to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the creation of a separate Ukraine and so on. Um, and in a sense, they were, they were right, but as, as I see it, they took the excuse of the Archduke's assassination to, uh, to push the Austrians, who were biting their fingers uh, for, uh, into war. And when I looked into the, what the Austrian army did, it was obvious that they were delaying and delaying and delaying with their mobilization. When they did finally say uh, mobilization will happen, plenty of people, plenty of men, out of enthusiasm, reported on the first day, uh, whereas they were supposed to report a week later. And these young men would arrive at the, in the uh, Korbacerk headquarters in Graz, and they would be told, go home again, you're not wanted until Wednesday, which is a good way of damping people's enthusiasm. Now, <coughs> the trouble is, Austria-Hungary, and Hungary in particular, got drawn into that German war with, uh, to start off with, an awful lot of enthusiasm. And of course, it's that it leads direct to the uh, the disaster of Trianon, uh, an indefensible, silly treaty. And, um, uh, and then, of course, the whole tragedy of Nem Nem Shoha in the interwar period. Mm. Uh, but it's, uh, I sometimes, there's a little question involved in this. I wonder if anybody, well, I think I know what the answer is. But the question is really this. Uh, in January 1915, Professor Masaryk, 
uh, got on a train to Italy, got himself to Holland, uh, got in touch with Seton Watson in England, and only himself and some papers, some luggage, they couldn't find a taxi, it was winter, um, puts up in some cheap hotel and establishes in the end an independent Czechoslovakia, which was, of course, a, a, a very artificial creation. Um, I sometimes wonder, why did no Hungarian do that? Why did, why did Hungary not set up an exile presence in England or America? It's, um, I mean, I suppose, again, Kari would be the man to have done it. But then, you know, how could a grand, a grand Hungarian aristocrat abandon the country at that sort of time? It's more or less unthinkable. But it's a good question to ask. Why did the Czechs get it right and the Hungarians wrong? Uh, I, I will take up that challenge, if I may, um, and also highlight that you raise the issue, but I find you offer different conclusions in the case of the Second World War. Uh, let's compare situations briefly. And then I, I will actually ask you about what I see in the book as perhaps uh, a, an opposition that you don't spell out. And maybe this is the time to do it. Uh, uh, the book does ask this question about uh, if the Czechoslovaks with Masaryk and Sidon Watson in uh, Britain and uh, then Benesh and Ernest Denis in Paris are, are engaging in, in this type of very perseverant work and uh, with Wickhamsteed, uh, who's per perhaps more influential at the time than Sidon Watson, um, being a journalist, uh, I believe, all the times, right? And, and um, uh, Hungarians are not doing it. And my answer to that would be that uh, it's impossible for a nation which has just reestablished itself in a fairly triumphant way, uh, who consider themselves to be an imperial nation. And you do describe uh, the more far-fetched ideas about how Hungary would stretch to the Balkans and how 30 million Hungarians would come to dominate the region. So you know the, the mindset there. For a Károly, no matter that he's in France when hostilities began in 1914, it's, it's unimaginable, and certainly for a and anybody else, to occupy any other position than uh, the fact that we're stakeholders in the monarchy, with a dual monarchy, we're stakeholders in the alliance, we are um, sort of a, not a great nation, but a component part of a great power nevertheless. We are fighting this war and there is a level of national unity that is sustained at least, I would argue, until 1918 in terms of not questioning this participation. You don't have to be enthusiastic about the war, but you still sort of accept a sort of call for cohesion. Uh, and then you yourself describe behind the Second World War, and that's, I think, a very, it's really useful for, for Hungarians to be reminded of that. There is an attempt on the part of certain elements in the Horty establishment to set up an exile government in uh, the United States by delegating Tibor Eckhart, who was an opposition politician, but he was also a former white army officer, so was a trustworthy figure to Horty and others. Um, but opposition, a, a delegate of Hungary to the League of Nations, so was supposed to have been sort of this I don't know, milder face of uh, the era, dispatched to, to DC only to find that he will not be taken seriously and he will not be accepted, be I think rightly so, as you write, because there is no real opposition movement in Hungary behind him. It's very easy for the allies to correctly assess that this is hedging bets, nothing else. Eckhart is an investment made on the part of the establishment to build an afterlife after the war in case the Germans lose. So I, I'm really skeptical based on what you write about the Second World War constellation, whether anything of the sort that you propose could have been done in the, in, in, in the, in the First World War. What would have happened had a number of Hungarian aristocrats put up tent uh, in, in Paris or in, in, in London? Um, when the country is relatively united in the war effort, 
Um, and um, there is no real movement against the war up until later in 1918, and then it's a very left-wing movement. So uh, I was a little bit um, actually uh, find, found myself disagreeing with the assessment you give of, uh, let's call it skillful nationalism and skillful nation building on the part of the Czechs and a sort of uh, political uh, um, blindness on the part of the Hungarians in World War I in the light of your assessment of World War II. You know, I stand corrected. <laughs> I really have to give in to you on this. Um, I think in the Second World War, I think you're right about, you must, you know, you must be right, that if uh, Tibor Eckhart turns up in Washington and, and, and represents nobody. Um, I mean, having said that, if you go around Moravia especially, you see lots of war memorials to Czechs who died in the First World War, quite enthusiastically on the Italian front, etc. Um, I mean, the, the argument was, I think, with uh, was uh, uh, Oladar uh, Segedi Bosak, that uh, if they'd sent the gold reserve abroad, that was the that was the argument. Uh, but yes, I, I mean, I, I take your point. It's a silly question, really. Um. <laughs> I find that uh, in, the, in the discussion of World War II, you're, uh, you're in a way you're very realistic about uh, uh, showing, and also this is true of First World War, how Hungarian options at times can be just very, very limited. And in fact, this is a recurrent theme, and I will open up this Pandora's box for a little while. Um, uh, would you share with, with us uh, perhaps your take on statesmanship and uh, let's sort of call it uh, historical contingency. You seem to, to approach the subject several times, but you have a very nuanced view and I wouldn't dare to reduce it to either extreme. You're certainly balancing, uh, on the one hand, the effect of historical circumstance and on the other, let's call it political agency or the ability to uh, engage in innovative politics that does have an impact on the world. In the history of Hungary, how do you see this mix of historical pressures, contingencies, and, and the, the influence of the statesman? Um, it's perfectly true, of course, that the, the country's op uh, options are, uh, are terribly limited, and I think the British understood that in the Second World War. Uh, for they understood that uh, Hungary had very little choice uh, as to what was going on. Um, now, uh, there were people who could um, manage this very bad set of cards. And, uh, the first is, of course, Betlan. Betlan managed things in the 20s um, quite remarkably well. I mean, I think the the first part of the hot era is a period, again, when quite a lot of, well, old-fashioned progress is made, for instance, in education, getting the finances sorted out. Um, destroyed, of course, by the world of the Great Slump. Now, <clears throat> uh, what would Bettler, how would Betlan have behaved in 1938? Is a, is, um, how would he have done it? Uh, and it's, I suppose it is true that if if, um, if Hungary does produce uh, an outstanding figure, now uh, uh, Tisa is a case in point, isn't he? Istvan Tisa is a case in point that here is somebody who manages a, a, a terrible parliamentary crisis uh, with an opposition which was, I think, is there anything to be said for that opposition? We could argue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and puts the country back on its, uh, back on its parliamentary pins. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't think we should try and get this topical, but I think when, um, when Hungary does produce an outstanding figure, it's worth um, it's worth a great deal because uh, you, they they earn a lot of respect abroad, apart from anything else. 
There's one other thing I wanted to say. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm having what in English is called a senior moment. Um, uh, I will take you up on this, use this break to, to dwell on Bethlehem. Just, just a sub-question. Um, I, I would, by the way, agree with the assessment you give of Bethlehem, and uh, it's very hard not to see a sort, a, a, a sort of a, a natural political talent in what he does. But in your book, you very correctly also highlight that there were certain, let's call them structural challenges, in interwar Hungary that remained unresolved. You write about the plight of the rural poor, uh, the masses uh, who lived, as you, as you, as you, I think you called them, you called them in one point a sort of a one hot peasant or a one something like that, yes. uh, which is very adept. They yeah. had no land, yeah. uh, no possessions to speak of beyond perhaps a fairly. Um, uncomfortable home, uh, single room, uh, sort of family living there, and also about uh, urban workers who, thanks to certain political dealings between Batman and the Social Democrats, had a slightly better, um, or not so slightly better life. Uh, so you, you identify this unresolved structural tension uh, that great estates are productive, Batman is protecting great estates, is putting the Hungarian economy back on the feet, uh, but uh, there is a terrible social cost to be paid and there is a social tension that is unresolved. Uh, so if you look at Batland's political work and broadly speaking, the, the, the interwar period, how do you see, was there a, a sustainable way out of that predicament? Uh, had, let's, let's engage in a counterfactual. Let's assume Hitler gets hit by a train in 1928 or something. Uh, uh, but we still have the Great Depression uh, with the escalation of social conflicts that it brings about in Hungary, do you think there would have been a way to gently uh, move towards an ever freer, ever more democratic Hungary in a conservative Batlanian footing? Was the Batlan system equipped to resolve these great contradictions that you identify in the book? Well, given, certainly given the, given the troubles of the 1930s, uh, it's, I mean, it would have been terribly difficult to overcome that. And I mean, I get quite interested in the business of, um, of greatest of great estates and uh, and you know all these all these poor peasants. Now, in, in for a start, in uh, the great estates in England, actually occupied more land than they did in the whole in the, in the whole of European Russia in 1916, because the Russian nobles sold up. They had such difficult relations with the peasants that they just sold up and bought property in town, in towns. Uh, I mean, in Hungary, the, the great estates also worked. And this is something I, I, I get quite interested in, because, you know, you look at, uh, you look at countries which did have land reform. Take Romania. Um, I mean, its uh, agricultural performance went right down. If peasants haven't got, uh, well, if if they drink, uh, then uh, there's obviously going to be some decline. And um, again, this is something which uh, I, mean, I haven't mentioned this so far, but I mean, I was struck in, Hung in Hungarian history by the in which Calvinists, especially, but also Lutherans, came up uh, in, a, in a greater numbers than, than in, in, with greater effect than their numbers warranted. All those, all those grim schools, for which, as a Scotsman, I've got a certain tenderness. And uh, and you know, if you if you're a serf, a serf boy, you get taught by one of these grim figures, uh, you learn, uh, you avoid drink, debt, and so on. You can make your way up, as say Ilyich did. And the, the greatest states don't have an interest in alienating their own workforce. 
I think the, the great estates in Western Hungary, especially, were, I would say, tolerably happy and, um, and uh, productive places, so long as they had a market. Uh, further east, I suppose, it was, uh, it was a problem and where the soil is bad. But it's, um, you know, there is a lot to be said for, for, the, for the big estate. Um, with a system of welfare and paternalism and so on. Uh, I would like to know, by the way, why there was a Festetic who had actually set up a Nazi party. And uh, he, I mean, he got out of it because they got rid of him because he wouldn't sack the Jews whom he employed as accountants. And uh, so he realized the errors of his ways, was put in prison for a bit, but ended up living outside Kesthay in a, in a decent cottage. I don't understand the circumstances of that. Do you know them? Yeah, I think it, it is a much discussed uh, question uh, whether um, certain Hungarian aristocrats were just... Uh, um, why they, by these dalliances, and it was also a Palfi, not just a Festetic, but also a Palfi, who became a, what we would call at least a proxy national socialist. So there were several Hungarian aristocrats, rich, not bankrupt, which is the real question, because you would understand a bankrupt aristocrat um, lending a name to a fledgling far-right party, but that was not the case in, 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 uh, in, in, in Hungary. Um, and... Uh, I think one key to understanding it, and you do mention that again in the book, which is, I think, a very, uh, very incisive remark. Uh, and I don't know if it has to do with any sentiments against Catholics, but, but certainly, certainly there was a tradition, a political tradition in interwar Hungary, very much building on rerum novarum and then quadragesimo anno, so the two uh, popal declarations about uh, social responsibility and, and in a way anti-capitalism and, and anti sort of an anti, translated as an anti-liberal manifesto that set off people on very different paths. An other aristocrat, Széchenyi György, who you also mentioned, and Apponyi György, uh, you also mentioned uh, at certain points in the book, well, they, and Széchenyi ended up being a Democrat with Barankovic, founding the precursor, the first modern Christian Democratic Party in Hungary in 1944, and sort of semi-hiding. Um, so you, you could go either way. But I think you do uh, actually offer the keys in the book by highlighting how some people took Christian socialism or Christian social teaching, not socialism, but Christian, Christian social teachings of uh, reform Catholicism, neo-Catholicism, and migrated gradually to the right. And you actually highlight how it was very easy to be a dogmatic anti-liberal and become an anti-Semite if you only wandered down that certain path. Uh, of course, others did not. Uh, many did not. But, but one of the reasons why I so thoroughly enjoyed the book was that all of these uh, problems were raised without, and I, I emphasize that, without going over into some sort of a generalization. Uh, at no point does Professor Stone claim, for instance, that this rightward drift based on, on, on neo-Catholicism became you know, universal. And I think it's a very balanced account. And we also see the other aristocrats who are also in a Catholic party go the other way. So uh, uh, I, I, I really like that account, as short as it is because of constraints uh, here um, uh, about, about this problem. Now, one thing we did not have, uh, I think, but maybe some people will correct me, is uh, uh, too many of these um, aristocrats then uh, uh, siding uh, with the communists, uh, the next era, which of course they couldn't. So we'll never find out if, given the chance, uh, we might have found an, a Hungarian aristocrat who also uh, you know, walks that path. You do, however, and I, I want to challenge you a little bit, not because I'm convinced of my uh, own truth, but because I think we would learn a lot if you, if you kind of gave us your views on this. And because time is running out and we want to leave uh, time for questions, I, I do want to discuss post-1945 history for a little bit. Um, one of the things, of course, with Britain that you brought up as an example is that the share of population that lives 
of agriculture is very low. In Hungary, it was about 60% uh, at the time when you're referencing, and later 45, 48% before the Second World War. Uh, what communism did, and I'm provoking you here, is finally do that industrialization that you say Betlan had in mind but couldn't quite pull off, that the 1930s, uh, more far-right or radical-right people had in mind but couldn't quite... Well, but the communists pulled off the radicalization. They reduced the number of people working in agriculture and they set up, not great estates, but cooperatives. And they, in a way, solve the plight of the rural poor, at least for a while. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm being provocative here, but this would be the super positive assessment of... Uh, the socialist period, focusing on how the structure of Hungarian society is largely modernized in this era. Uh, how do you see the historical perform performance, not of Rákosi, not of the Stalinists, not of the, you know, the, 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 the dogmatic mass murderers, but the murderer turned, I don't know, semi-benevolent ruler, uh, Janos Kádár? Uh, so, the, what did Kadar pull off uh, in your, uh, in your uh, assessment as sort of being at the helm of this very ambiguous period of, of moving away from a, from a sort of mass retribution, mass murder, uh, to a dictatorship which was unfree in pretty much every sense of the word, uh, but nevertheless seems to have, maybe not sustainably, but resolve some of the major challenges that previous regimes failed at resolving. Does that factor into your assessment of the post-1945 era at all? How, do you, how would you weigh social progress or social political achievements against uh, uh, the radical uh, oppression uh, that in a hard form or a soft form, but nevertheless characterized, of course, the era of state socialism? It's, this one's very, very difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult, especially for an outsider. I mean, it was, it was of course, wonderful coming to Hungary in the 1980s when uh, you know, fascinating people, things sort of worked. It had a... I mean, it had... A, well, let me put it this way. I mean, I, I was present at a very gloomy gathering where um, uh, some quite senior Hungarians were saying, oh, things are pretty terrible, the health service, tra transport, and so on. And, uh, and uh, they said, look how much behind Austria we are. And I thought, well, look, cheer up, chaps. Um, name an Austrian. And it's quite difficult to name an Austrian. There was no difficulty at all in naming about 10 Hungarians straight away. <laughs> um, so cheer up, chaps. Now, uh, but when it comes to the uh, Qatar business, I remember seeing in public, uh, in a gathering with Paul, Fo Paul Fodor, who's the chairman of the Academy of Sciences, I sort of took the view that, well, Qatar, well, yes, he... Um, he at least, you know, well, the obvious arguments. And he said, he said this, uh, Qadar corrupted agriculture and um, he, he destroyed the qualities of the Hungarian farmer. It never occurred to me, and of course I, I, I know nothing about agriculture, but it's, um, I mean, I know that nowadays it is a, it's a problem, isn't it? Agriculture, it's... Uh, because I mean, this country should be a Denmark, and it should uh, it should rely on its brains. It should have a big, a big developed service sector, shipping up and down the Danube, and of course, very prosperous agriculture. Uh, instead of which, it did land itself with the wrong sort of industrialization, didn't it? Uh, and that was this was the problem that once you were involved with Comic Con, um, you. You lost the contacts with the West, which are of course vital. I think I think the whole of Comic Con had a foreign trade less than Belgium, and um, 
once you get involved in this kind of thing, you simply don't have the challenge and the competition. Now, look, I'm talking way beyond anything that I can conceivably know about. I think it's probably true that uh, they should have kept the bus thing and the, uh, they should have kept things going in chapel which were closed down by the Europeans. I, I, um, uh, there were things which could have been rescued, I'm told, but it's not something I, I, I know about. Um, and the trouble with Qatar is, you know, with everything that goes wrong with it, uh, you could travel, you know, you could read whatever you wanted to. There wasn't this... I mean, Romania was, it was a, a, that childish nonsense that you came across in, uh, in that country. I went twice in the Ceausescu time. Um, Poland did, in a sense, resist, and the economy memorably collapsed. Uh, you know, you were better off, in a way, under Qadar, but of course it left uh, it left this questionable legacy didn't it this um, what what i what i think is still present here is uh, i call it the isotopic half life of communism uh, which uh, does need um, and um, it's a terribly difficult thing for an outsider to uh, to preach about because there's no question it was better to be a hungarian than anything else in the 1970s. A lot of people seem to be very nostalgic for it. Um, uh, but you can see the drawbacks that, um, uh, which I think are still with us. But I'm, I, you know, I, every person in this room would know the background to this better than me. Well, thank you very much. and. Uh, there's so much to, uh, left to discuss, but we do have, to, well, we don't have to, but we will nevertheless open up the floor to questions. I will take this privilege to say three concluding remarks. One is a recommendation by the book, uh, please. Uh, and one of the reasons that have not been said, uh, discussed so far, and will not now, but I, I'll point it out to you, is that when it comes to discussing um, real existing socialism uh, uh, of the later variants of 1980s, uh, you do see accounts in this book, fantastic accounts, short stories, Professor Stone visiting, and let me tell you, this is the historian's assessment and there is the eyewitness assessment with irony and uh, sort of highlighting and pinpointing the ridiculous, uh, which is, I suppose, an unavoidable uh, corollary to a crumbling regime. The more a regime survives itself, the more ridiculous it becomes. And by the time you visit in 1985 and you describe your visit to the then Hungarian Institute of International Relations, uh, priceless. Uh, you won't get that anywhere else than from the book. Uh, so uh, that was one remark. The other is that, uh, I, which is, I, I will call sort of conflate the two into one idea. I really couldn't decide uh, uh, whether this book is gently telling us that history is the greatest force and that human action can only reach so far because look, in the good and in the bad, the book I think correctly assesses that at each time, at each historical era, Hungary was sort of at the border of the West. You make that argument explicitly with Gothic cathedrals, which is a famous, famous one. But also that sort of Transylvania is at the eastern border of, of the European Gothic style, right? Uh, but not what has changed then in about a thousand years. Uh, we never fallen that far behind, except maybe for the period of the Ottoman Wars, which was a terrible devastation. And we haven't really gone that much further ahead, have we? Um, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, there is also, I think, a, a sort of a friendly optimism shining through the book about uh, uh, sort of an ir irrepressible spirit native to a small nation that somehow has uh, survived, which is reflected in your positive assessment of Brian Cartledge's book, which is perhaps more optimistic than yours, and I would argue that yours is more nuanced than his, by the way. Uh, uh, but 
there is a lot of fine discussion uh, which doesn't discount either part of our great historical equation, uh, conditions and circumstance and, and, and the human element, uh, which makes for a really fascinating read which shouldn't be read too fast, so we have time to contemplate uh, uh, these am ambiguities that accompany history and Hungarian history in particular. With that said, uh, we have, I believe, about 20 minutes for questions. What I would do is go perhaps in twos or threes. What should we do? I, I would go in twos. Uh, uh, and so we'll take the first two questions now and then Professor Stone will react and then we'll see if we get one or two additional rounds in. Yeah, Peter Tarlow. Uh, I uh, wanted to uh, say that we have a propensity as Hungarians to talk to, to ourselves in our own language and not in uh, foreign languages as opposed to the Czechs uh, for example, in America, who supposedly had like 4,000 uh, uh, nationals as professors in America, writing books in English and uh, having their ideas uh, put in the American uh, scene. And another thing I wanted to mention, observation about Professor Eckhart. Uh, he, I had the good fortune to be taught by him, and um, he was a, a fine, nationalistic Hungarian uh, who shared uh, in, in his some time of his exile uh, quarters with uh, um, President de Gaulle in Egypt. And uh, he told me about the stories uh, of uh, other Hungarian politicians, for example in America, the so-called National Committee, um, who were on the payroll of the government and this he never, he always refused to do. Like the goal, uh, he was often criticized for representing uh, the pure Hungarian point of view. The goal, of course, the French interest, like uh, Vive le Quebec Libre. And um, uh, for example, he told me that the committee, when he, they were asked in 1956, what should uh, the US government do uh, the opinion was send them medicine. So they were not entirely not uh, nationalistic and not representing the Hungarian point of view. But this was the comments I wanted to make. And uh, we had a second question from um, Yeah, I, I do have a question. Um, Dr. Romšić mentioned that the last golden age of Hungary began in 1867, um, and it's also picking up on, on one of your concluding remarks. And, and, and Norman, you also talked about how in 1989 Hungary sprang, not fully armed, but quite well armed from the thigh of, of Comic-Con. Can we hope for another golden age, do you think? gives us a chance to discuss the part that we did not discuss. The closer we inch to the present, the more ambiguous things become. Uh, Professor. Well, um, uh, to the first question, I, I, mean, I think it is certainly true that the Czechs, the Czechs handled the, handled the West better. Um, uh, certainly in, uh, you know, in the Second World War, there's, uh, uh, on the other hand, the Czechs, well, you know, you, let's not forget that in 1943, Benesch went to Moscow and did a deal with Stalin uh, by which the Red Army would not occupy Bohemia after the war, and in exchange, Stalin would get Ruthenia. And that was more or less the bargain. Uh, was, it, was it the right thing to do? And of course, the Czechs got, in the end, the worst form of communism, whereas the Poles sticking in, uh, making a pest of themselves to Churchill, in the end did better out of it. It's a query. But I agree about the, the public, the Hungarian approach to this kind of thing has been not terribly well chosen. Uh, um, you know, I think there's probably better ways of doing it. 
Well, uh, the second one, Golden Age. Well, um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm I am pretty optimistic about it, really, because um, I remember when the when the Iron Curtain fell, a lot of Western businesses, English businesses, got involved in what could they do in uh, in the in the uh, ex people's democracies and. I, mean, I vaguely know how to do it now, but I was completely useless as giving any possible advice to business. Um, I, and you know, the sort of thing I would say is, so yeah, well, look, they've got a very good education system and they're very clever. And businesses don't really want to hear that. They, they're not interested whether people are good poets and classicists and historians and fun to be with. They want to know, can they form a team and be trustworthy and deliver? And what are their resources, this kind of thing. So my talk was not a success at all. And I've, it's been very bewildering to see how Hungary especially has remained um, you know, behind Austria. You see it on the border. When you, uh, if you go from Roost on the noisy Dozzy over into Schopron, you can see the Drop it. You know, everybody here knows what I mean. I don't understand it. Whose fault is it? Um, I mean, I'm inclined to say it's the uh, it's the uh, the Georgian government and the the way the Europeans handled um, agriculture in particular, plus the business of the banks. Um, but it's not something I know in detail. I can only utter a few um, well modulated prejudices and. Uh, but it's certainly very surprising that a country like this has not uh, reached the level of Austria. And you go around the streets, you see these poor people on Zimmer frames. I hear bad stories about the health system. Not universally, of course, but uh, a lot of complaints. And it is just really, you know, nearly 30 years after the end of communism. Uh, why has Antal's dream of catching up with Austria not um, not happened. I wish I knew more about this because I'm obviously very sympathetic to to um, to, the, to the country in general. Uh, now, uh, yes, the Europeans not helping. Uh, it was, I must say, I thought very dismaying when the European Parliament made it its business to uh, produce a huge majority of large condemning the government of Viktor Orban. Because you have to ask at one point, well, what business is it of theirs? None is the answer. And the second thing is that the European Parliament might bear in mind the example of what happened in Austria. Uh, the compromise came about in 1867 because the Hungarians made a deal with some of uh, some of the what they called themselves Deutsch Liberalen, and they were people who, you know, they had that charmless lecturing style of Central European of German politicians. They passed their laws about insurance, their, the endless lawyers, endless professors going with, on with beards, going up and down. Um, and a section of them decided that they would take the Austrian parliament, they would, ex they would have a very limited franchise voting in such a way that there was an artificial German minor ma majority Divided between Catholics and non cat or, or free thinking, if you like, but still an artificial German majority. Now, when the clericals came in, and it was centralized, if you wanted to dictate laws in Vienna, for Bohemia or Slovenia, wherever, you could, not in Hungary. Um, but you could get away with it in Vienna. Now, in time, by 1879, they lose power, and a clerical coalition comes in 
which does a deal with the Czechs and the Slovenes and the Poles, of course, and then starts operating the centralization in a different direction. So everything is centralized on Vienna, discussed there. And in, uh, it, so it comes to absurdities, such as the central Viennese parliament discussing whether, in a little place called Celje, the Slovenes have the right to a gymnasium. And people shake with rage. There's obstruction in the parliament. Ink pots get thrown. And then the, Ukra the Ruthenes get involved. And they, poor things, divided three ways. Some said, we're Ukrainians. Others said, Ukrainians really just a form of Russian. And others said, we're Ruthenes. And it comes to battles in the Reichsrat again, where some deputy spoke for 12 hours in Russian, and the professor of law at the German University in Prague blew a cavalry trumpet. Um, now this kind of thing happens if you centralize, if you make a, an unreal institution of extreme centralization. And so we get things like the European Parliament. I wish it, I wish it just consisted of delegations of national parliaments with very strict law rules about what it can and what it cannot do. Because otherwise we're going to get uh, it making this terrible mistake. They made it with Waldheim in Austria. Admittedly, Waldheim was a horror. Um, a slimy little liar, thief. Um, and uh, the Europeans denounced him, said, we oh, and having nothing to do with you. The result was he got elected by about 90% of the Austrians. Uh, and I wish the Europeans wouldn't do this kind of thing. They've got, uh, they should recognize the mistakes they've made and uh, treat Hungary, I think, in a rather different style. Well, thank you very much. And by the way, uh, if you enjoy reading highly Eurosceptic quips, there are, I can't tell about eight or nine in the book. I thoroughly disagree, but they are insightful and fun to read. Uh, and they're certainly thought evoking. Um, Hegel, I assume you hate Hegel. Hegel. Uh, look, I've never read him. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a judgment, that's, a, that's an ironic judgment right there. But just this famous saying is, is uh, of course, um, known to, the, has, has sort of a life of its own. The all of Minerva spreads its wings at dusk. So I, I avoided discussing uh, some of the finer points that have to do with uh, history, which is still ongoing, but it's, uh, part of it is in the book. And um, uh, I, I sort of will take this opportunity to uh, lodge my complaint on, on, on two points uh, without thinking that we can agree on, or even that we should agree on. One, that the Austrian parliament especially at the time of its gravest crisis, was based on universal suffrage. The Hungarian, as you describe, started with about 14% of the population voting, sinking to about 7, 8, due to various you know, losses in the uh, financial standing of certain people who had voting rights before and whatnot. So had it not the Hungarian parliament of 1911, devolved into a shouting match between a roughly 50%, you know, um, Romanian, Slovak, Serb, Croat, uh, plus a good chunk of social democratic deputies and, you know, the establishment deputies had it, you know, organized itself on the basis of universal suffrage as, did, as the Austrians did after 1904. Um, so I, I think it's a double-edged sword to take the Austrian part of the empire and argue that the nonsense that you so aptly described, that you see in the pre-1914 Austrian parliament, uh, somehow is an attestation to um, the superior, I don't know, political qualities or, polit or the superiority of the Hungarian political system, because as it were, that Austrian parliament was at least showing us, as we find out, the truth 
about the state of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I would argue, whereas the Hungarian, based on this very limited suffrage, was covering it up. Yeah, well, you, the trouble with this is that uh, the Austrian parliament, even in, before universal suffrage, when it was, when the electorate in 1893 was, it was something like 15%. It was just as bad. You know, the, the nationality problem in the Austrian Empire, just as bad. Universal suffrage just expanded it. You know, with trade unions, trade unions, and even the Catholic Church. But would not the Hungarian parliament have produced similar since if... Well, you know, you, you, if they'd had the sense. Well, is it... Uh, if, if they'd had the sense to set up, shall we say, uh, some kind of autonomous area. I don't know how you'd have divided Transylvania or what, or if you needed to, but uh, if if anybody had been creative enough to suggest that, of course it's terribly difficult. I mean, what do you do about people like the Slovaks? There are, I gather, three variants of Slovak, not particularly well developed. An awful lot of Slovaks just simply become Hungarian, become uh, Magyars, as we say. Um, uh, and if you set up an autonomous area, what sort of Slovak's going to run it? And they were very divided. I mean, in the end, the, the thing, I think it's true to say that the, the Slovak part of Czechoslovakia was done by the uh, Slovak Lutherans, um, not, the, not the Catholics. I mean, it would have been terribly difficult to do, but still, if you're running that kind of thing where people are becoming literate, the economy is changing pretty fast, then some kind of decentralization is, um, is probably, well, it, it has to be done. The one thing I, 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 I do wonder about is Croatia. You know, if um, the Hungarians did say in, their, in 1867, that our aim is the triune kingdom of Dalmatia, which was under Austria, Croatia and Slavonia, which were under Hungary. If we put them together as a Croat unit and then say we could even call it Yugoslav and include the Serbs, but centering it on Zagreb, is that not going to solve an awful lot of problems? I mean, I've... Uh, it, uh, it would have solved the, or could have solved the whole Bosnian problem, but it would have meant the Hungarians, not only Tisa could have done it, standing back and saying, yes, we'll let you have a Yugoslav unit under the Habsburgs and call it Austro-Slav or whatever. But again, that I think is, is, the, is the, the one thing that uh, you, know, you wonder about. Uh, although I know he, I mean, Franz Ferdinand was supposed to believe in it, but apparently he didn't terribly. He, he was no great, uh, great, great believer in it. And Franz Josef simply said, believe, believe me, the monarchy can't be run in any other way. What was it that Taffer said? Um, uh, beyond the achievement on all sides of a tolerable level of discontent, I have no ambition. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that and also uh, the way it's, it's discussed in the book is, is fairly fascinating. It's, it's great that the 19th century Hungarian, uh, pecu this peculiar constellation of being in a multi-ethnic country in another multi-ethnic empire uh, gets both sides of the story. So it's also fun to read for the Austrian parts, by the way. Uh, we, we do have some time left uh, for another round of questions, so let's take a second. Uh, I would like to make a remark about uh, comparing uh, the inheritance tax in Britain and Hungary between the two world wars. Uh, after the First World War, there were, uh, in Britain were introduced an inheritance tax, 40%, uh, then 50%. 
uh, if we compare it to Hungary, where the large uh, entities, Hidbizomány, large family foundations, were exempt from inheritance tax. I think the first was a way of uh, slow reform and the, the redistribution for the social justice. The second was a, a very rigid system. Um, yeah, um, first of all, a very quick question on um, an area you mentioned, namely the difference between Austria and Hungarian levels of agriculture, where I agree with you, my observation uh, chimes with yours. There is an exception, and that is the wine industry, it seems to me. And uh, I wonder why we think that is, particularly since wine is now an a crowded and very competitive market internationally. Um, I'm not sure that exports are as good as they should be, maybe for that reason, but nonetheless, the performance of the wine industry has taken a huge upward leap, I think, since 89. A second question relates to the difficulty of Hungary finding ways of surrendering in the, the Second World War. Um, you mentioned the um, Tibor Eckhart. There's also people in Istanbul representing the government. There's um, Aladar Zegri Mazak at various times in Sweden. Um, and there is Domoko Sentivani, whose uh, memoirs uh, our neighbours at the Hungarian Review published last year. He was always of the opinion, he's quite sceptical, of, um, for example, of Segedi Mazak on the grounds that the West, you want, to send a, you want to surrender to the West, but there's no way you can possibly do so. The West isn't there to surrender to. He wants to, in a sense, and he succeeds in playing a part in, surrendering to the Soviet Union on the grounds that that's the only way Hungary can get out of the war. Obviously, there were huge cultural objections to that. But would it have been possible to do? I know that the actual attempt failed for other reasons, but do you think that was a sensible or reasonable strategy uh, of, of solving the, what was a terribly intractable problem? Actually, Molotov offered to Horty that Hungary can keep all the reacquired possessions in Transylvania and the Highlands if Hungary would cease uh, hostilities on the Eastern Front. And there was absolutely no reason to reject this offer, which may have been dishonest, as we know, which may have been risky. Yes, it may have. But it certainly wasn't as threatening as the actual outcome. And Horty rejected this offer strictly based on his personal dislike for communism and f for Russians. So there was an alternative, yes. And even if the West wasn't there due to prior commitments that they made amongst themselves, Hungary had a chance to surrender to the Soviet Union, but missed it. And if, if I am in this lucky position that I can speak, for the nostalgia about the Kadar regime, I would like to make a small remark, namely that this is actually not a nostalgia for the Kadar regime, which was really lousy, but it is, in our generation, it's nostalgia for our youth which you only knew the Qadar regime, so we had no other <laughs> subject for nostalgia but the Qadar regime. It is not really an objective feeling. Okay. Uh, uh, why not accept your word? <laughs> um, uh, the... Um, uh, if I, if I understood you rightly, you were asking about um, how, uh, uh, how England and uh, Hungary compared between the wars about tax. Ah, uh, 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 good. Yes. Uh, it's a very interesting question because the, the great estates were affected by death duties. And inheritance taxes were quite high and the, the trouble was that 
the, if, uh, if, say, as happened, a father died in the First World War, and then a, then a son died, and then another son died, three times round they faced, they faced inheritance taxes, and it ruined some of the big families. The Fitzwilliams, for instance, were ruined by it. Uh, I think the Hungarian landowners were not particularly taxed, and yeah, they, they, and it, I mean, it's very, very difficult to tax, uh, to tax agriculture. It's, I think it's, um, it's, 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 uh, it's defeated, um, defeated countries which have got more than 50% living on the land. I mean, the, France particularly, just had, um, they gave up trying to collect an income tax and Clemenceau said it's easy to get a Frenchman to give his life for his country, but his money never. And uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, it was just very difficult. I, I don't think, apart from the inheritance tax, the tax on land in England was um, was particularly high. It would have been very difficult to do, you know, with agricultural prices going down, profits going down. How do you write them off? Uh, it's, it's, it is endlessly complicated. Nowadays, nowadays the, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the European Union, bless it, makes wonderful arrangements by which, um, you know, if you get involved in forestry, you give them lots of subsidies. So the, the great estates in England, the Duke of Buccleuch, for instance, goes in for lots and lots of trees and is paid for it. And, he's, and that family is down to its last Rembrandts, last nine Rembrandts. Um, the, uh, it is a, uh, and the other one, the other thing, of course, that the Europeans have got spectacularly wrong is agriculture. You know, they used, in the old days, a student cost less than a cow. Um, and then they started trying to put down production to increase the value of it. So now we can proudly say that a student costs less than a non-cow. Uh, it is um, taxing agriculture very, very difficult. Um, uh, the other question was... Uh, oh, yes, yes. <coughs> Well, I mean, in a sense, I think the Molotov offer to Horty actually came in um, in, uh, in July 1941, didn't it? And and uh, he just threw it aside. And the trouble was timing. Uh, you know, up right up to 1943 and the collapse of uh, Mussolini, Mussolini, you could think the Allies are in Italy; they're going to come over into the Balkans. And so we'll, we, we don't need to surrender to the Russians because the Americans, the British, will be there. And that was, in, that was, a, that was an illusion which I think kept uh, Romanians, Hungarians, Croats even, uh, just hoping for the best and not taking up a, an approach to Russia. It, but it's, it's very curious, isn't it, that Benesh, sitting in London, with feeling her as a communist spy at his side. And um, he comes up with the idea of, let's just approach Stalin and see if we can do a deal. And he did, uh, which, uh, which I mentioned. Uh, and you um, mean, well, no, again, it's unthinkable in Hungary at that time that they would have approached Stalin. But no, you know, the other, sorry, I'm rambling. Um, the other, the other country which played, which, uh, which really, I mean, we could say got it right, was Finland. And, you know, the, the Finns had kept, when they were on the outskirts of Leningrad, um, Mannerheim said, we are not going further than this because the Russians will never forgive us. And the Finnish army stopped. And if it had gone on, Leningrad would possibly have fallen. Uh, and all the way through, they're keeping their contacts going with Madame Kollontai in Stockholm. And when the time comes in September 44, theoretically quite late in the day, 
a deal can be done. No Russian troops in Finland, some reparations such as they are, um, and Finland becomes a, a Russian satellite. She refused to join the Marshall Plan, but still, it's a, it's a democratic country and a prosperous one. And, and that's, that's the only case I know of, of a country in the Nazi coalition actually keeping links with the Russians going all through the Second World War. I don't think that ever happened with, with Hungary. That could be wrong. Thank you. As a, if I may be um, as bold as to add that uh, Czechoslovakia was occupied by Germany and the Finns beat the Russians and then got out. Well, not conclusively, but in June 1944, they stopped the Russian offensive and then negotiated. Neither of those skills uh, Hungary possessed, uh, being allied with the Germany and beaten, uh, which I think sort of uh, limited, li limited options. But uh, definitely, uh, I think this discussion has been a testament to the, the, the range of subjects that can be discussed uh, uh, after reading the book or uh, even before, but, but more knowledgeably after reading the book. So let me finish uh, by thanking our host, uh, thanking Professor Stone for uh, the many incisive remarks and the many more that are only available in the book. Um, I think uh, as with all great writing um, uh, of history, there is, a, there is a degree of ambivalence preserved and one is prompted to agree or disagree. I, I found myself wholeheartedly agreeing with, I don't know, 95% of the historical assessments and then disagreeing with the assessments about Viktor Orban and what's going on in the present in Hungary, that's the nature of politics. Uh, I, I am less convinced of uh, uh, the political acumen of the current prime minister than you are for, for, for certain, but uh, but at no point does this book offer an ideologically closed box uh, that, you, that you're not welcome to pick apart and to, to, to argue with. Uh, I, I think that's ultimately the, the hallmark of, of good historical writing, knowing that we never have a conclusive answer and that historical reason works in circles rather than in straight lines very often. And therefore, it's a totally enjoyable read that I recommend uh, you purchase for yourself and maybe as a gift. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much because you've already expressed the uh, gratitude I was about to call for, uh, for what has been a historically um, uh, enlightening conversation and at times high intellectual cabaret. So uh, this has been a marvelous entertainment as well as uh, an occasion to learn. Uh, secondly, um, of course, the, the book is available. Uh, you can buy it uh, quite freely and um, and I hope you will, but in the meantime, um, why not uh, enjoy yourself talking to the authors and the performers, and secondly, there's some coffee. And my wife now wants to say something. If you have purchased the book and like, would like Professor Stone to sign it, please, if you'll form a line, I'm sure he'd be happy to, to indulge. Thank you. <laughs>